And policy analyst Andrew McLeod now joins me to discuss this. Many thanks to you, Andrew McLeod, for joining us on this hour. Now, um, we've seen the pound sterling drop against the uh, dollar on the occasion of Brexit. Uh, what more, uh, what other economic impacts would, ha would this have on both sides of the divide, both the EU and the UK? Well, now we don't really know for sure this is where, to use a metaphor, rubber hits the road. Brexit is done, to put it in uh, Boris Johnson term, in, in the fact that Britain is no longer in the EU. But the economic consequence depends on the future trading arrangement between the EU and the United Kingdom. And as someone put it in the media in the last couple of days, this is the first time in history people with a free trade agreement are about to start negotiating about what barriers that they will be putting up. So the economic impact will very much depend on what the terms of the agreement are. Now, as of today, there's no change to the terms of trade or to the terms of migration because we're in this transition period until the 31st of December. Long-term economic impact will depend on what is the trade agreement that the two parties are going to negotiate. All right, Prime Minister Johnson has called for um, the Canada-style free trade deal with the EU, but we know that that deal took about seven years to negotiate. So how can he avoid that long, that long term in terms of negotiation with the EU? Well, it is an unusual negotiation. If you take the Canadian free trade agreement or the Australian free trade agreement, which I know better as an Australian, that you are taking two economic blocks that had no agreements in place and trying to create new agreements. Whereas right now, the United Kingdom and the European Union are in complete alignment with all of their trade policies because three days ago, the United Kingdom was in the EU. So it could, in theory, be a lot easier because already the UK and EU agree on things. So it's not about agreeing. It's now about agreeing on where to disagree. So, in theory, it perhaps could be quicker than the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, but it really, really depends on how divergent from the EU the, e the UK wishes to be. The more divergent it is, the big bigger the economic impact. Um, but, um, the EU is famously known to be very difficult to negotiate with uh, because of its internal politics. So how can the UK avoid um, hard Brexit? Well, I think the EU has shown an enormous amount of discipline during the last couple of years to have a united front in its negotiations with the United Kingdom. And I anticipate that that united front will continue. So I actually think it will be quicker and easier than a normal free trade agreement, but it will neither be quick nor easy, if that makes sense. All right, um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, I want to take a statement from him. Um, he talked about the free movement. He said that um, he, went, he welcomed the end of EU free movement. Uh, what would be the effect of these on immigration across Europe? Well, the Europeans have always said that you've got to have all four freedoms, the freedom of movement of people, uh, capital, etc. So this statement of a red line in the sand by the UK that we're no longer going to have free movement of people is a real red flag to the EU to say, well, we're going to start negotiating tough. You cannot have all the benefits and none of the costs of being in the EU. That's certainly the signal the EU wants to send. In terms of migration, we've already seen for the first time a net outflow of European migrants to Australia over the, sorry, to the United Kingdom over the last couple of years. So the tone has already said to EU citizens, it's time to leave. You've also got the question about long-term ongoing rights of UK citizens in the EU and EU citizens in the UK. That is still unclear as to what that means. Now, the British government does say it wants to increase its focus of migration to the Commonwealth. And it's interesting because well, I think there might be a little bit of racism here because when they say the Commonwealth, they really mean Canada, New Zealand and Australia. They don't really mean Nigeria, India and Pakistan. But to be honest, salaries are so much higher in Canada, Australia and New Zealand than they are in the United Kingdom that any liberalisation for migration with Australia, New Zealand and Canada will see UK citizens going there, not the other way around. But we already have seen an increased interest from countries like Nigeria, India and Pakistan. So it's going to be a bit of a, an interesting challenge to see how the UK manages its narrative around migration when most of the people who want to come here are not necessarily from the countries that the United Kingdom wants to attract people. 
All right, let me quickly ask you about the internal relations, or, or, or especially on politics in the UK, because the Prime Minister has also hinted at unity um, after the whole Brexit vote and, and, and con discussion across Europe. Uh, he said it's time for healing, but what will healing involve? You know, that's going to be a long-term and a difficult challenge. Remember, 48% of people voted to remain in the EU, 52% voted to leave. So it was very, very close. And many commentators have said the true belief of the general population was mainly to remain. It's just that the Remainers didn't vote. But that having been said, Britain's exited. That debate's over. The more interesting challenge is how do you create a unified narrative about what it is to be the United Kingdom? And I say the United Kingdom, not Britain or England, because, of course, you're going to have growing moves within Northern Ireland to trigger a referendum for the reunification with Ireland, whether that succeeds or not, we're yet to see. We've already seen members of the Scottish Parliament vote to have a second referendum on Scottish independence, so we don't know how that will go. So it's all very well to talk about unity of the United Kingdom, but Boris Johnson has a big challenge to keep the United Kingdom in place, let alone unify it. Policy analyst Andrew McLeod, thanks for your time.